Bila as the moderator of today's agenda, and I'm very pleased to see you here and welcome all of you to today's guest lectures. So today's agenda is about macrofinancial economics in the new normal era in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, our speakers today is Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono, PhD. He is one of the lecturer and researchers at Sampurna University. So before the presentations begins, let me inform you how the presentations will be going on. First, Mr. Wahyu will be invited to present all the materials. And after that, there will be a question and answer sessions and followed by the conclusions. Now, allow me to welcome the speakers, Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono, PhD, to deliver his presentations. So, Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono, PhD, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, Adinda, for your kind introduction. And thank you also for Professor Imamuddin Yuliadi, as, uh, has, who has invited me in this uh, important and special session you know, for the guest lecture. Uh, it, it's uh, kind of uh, an example yeah, for, for, for me as well yeah, to, to, to hold uh, uh, like guest lecture series for, for each course. Uh, it is very important to, uh, to share knowledge yeah, from, from, from other uh, uh, peers, from other universities. And uh, thank you very much one again, once again. Okay, uh, without further ado, I will try to uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, let me share first. Can okay? Can I share my screen, please, to enable my yeah? Not yet. Oh, still disabled. Okay. Please wait a minute. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so I share my screen. Here, there is also Pak Dimas, yeah, Dr. Dimas. How are you, Dr. Dimas? Hope you are well as well. Thank you very much for inviting me here. So, uh, my session, my, my, my uh, I mean, knowledge share, sharing, yeah, not, not lecture, it's just knowledge sharing. I believe all of you has uh learn uh, from from um, experts yeah in umw uh, umy sorry uh, and of course uh, uh many parts of macroeconomic issues have been covered but i would like to highlight something more about uh, policy implication or about experience during my my previous working experience as as consultant as financial economist in in, in 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 regulatory institutions and or international institutions. So basically, my my presentation will talk about the microfinancial economics in the new normal era in Indonesia. Of course, lesson learned from the U.S. financial crisis. So why why we link uh, our presentation to U.S. financial crisis? Okay, first of all, we step back a little bit about uh, how U.S. financial crisis was triggered, okay? And of course, uh, in the aftermath of the 2008 U.S. financial crisis, there will be uh, two explanations, yeah? two explanations as to why financial crisis in the U.S. happened. The first explanation is about secular stagnation secular stagnation, and secondly, is about saving class. So uh, Larry Summers, yeah, at the time, uh, prior to financial crisis, uh, mentioned that the, the root of financial crisis in the US is actually the domestic uh, economy. It's like investment declines, consumption declines, and government spending, which is not sufficient to boost, line, uh, to boost growth, et cetera. So basically, it's more on domestic factors that matters, yeah, to trigger the global financial crisis. But on the other hand, uh, Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, uh, 
highlighted that there was an imbalance, yeah, global imbalance in current account due to excess saving from other countries that finally lead to financial instability and lower economic growth potential. Why? Why is that? Okay, if we see the period before, yeah, if we see the period before 2008, before 2008, we have a seen here current account deficit, which is very deep, yeah, in the US. As you can see in, in, in this uh, graph, yeah, US is the most, uh, or the, the country with the deepest what, current account deficit. Yeah, at least compared to other developed countries and other and other emerging markets. Okay, so we see why why that happened because you know, before two thousand and eight, there was commodity boom. Yeah, there was commodity boom, so emerging markets producing large amount of commodity, coal, uh, raw materials. Okay export many things uh, around the world and they receive a lot of income from from export activities okay that's why uh, they need to save their money right uh, every country needs to save their money and what country what what country uh, or what destination yeah, of country uh, uh, for saving for international saving of course they prefer to go to the US because of low inflation and also because of stable economic potential, economic uh, development, of course, at that time. Okay, so many, many uh, countries uh, save their money in the US. That's why it makes current account deficit much deeper because in the um, component of current account balance, as you can see here, the component is trade balance plus return on a country stock of NFA, net foreign assets, yeah, or payment on its net foreign liabilities position. So basically, current account balance is not only about trade balance, but it's also about uh, country position, net foreign asset or liability position. That's why uh, it is very important. And the component that makes current account deficit in the US go uh, deeper yeah, because of what? Because the return, yeah, there is no return. In, in, in primary income, in primary income uh, uh, part, yeah, deficit occurred in a very substantial amount. Okay, that's why uh, current account deficit in the US is mostly caused by country stock uh, position on net foreign liability. So basically, uh, it's negative, yeah? Net position is negative. So basically, the US needs to pay more to foreign investor instead of getting more from their foreign investment. Okay. And because, because a lot of foreign, foreign savings enter to the US at that time, okay, then, of course, financial markets in the US need to be more developed, right? A lot of financial markets deepening, and then a lot of uh, investment products, born, subprime mortgage product uh, was created, and then a lot of securitization at that time. Because of what? Because when uh, people save their money in the US, of course, the US need to pay back the money uh, to the investor, right? To the investor, including uh, the interest payment. Of course, uh, the U.S. economic uh, development growth at the time, but at the same time, uh, stability, uh, financial instability occurs because of what? Because uh, financial markets deepening drives uh, banks, U.S. banks, and U.S. private sectors to offer. Uh, Credit to offer uh, investment products for low income societies, which basically, yeah, basically has lower uh, credit quality profile. That's why uh, financial crisis happened from 
subprime mortgage products. But not the root is not really subprime mortgage, but from the global imbalances. Uh, this is this is something of the story about setting club that is not really investigated by previous studies. So this is basically the, the room for you to to create a paper, of course, to create um, academic paper. And then uh, along that line, along that topic, I think that will be uh, fruitful yeah, uh, in terms of learning yeah, for, for, for other countries yeah, to prevent saving glut. Okay, so the issue of saving glut here, as you can see, the saving from the emerging markets and from ember, uh, from, from, from developed countries as well. Developed countries, as you see, saving also increased before 2008. Yeah, before 2008. And these countries save their money in the US. That's, that's the story about saving glut. So uh, this is, if, if you remember about, about Paradox of saving. Maybe, maybe you you already heard about paradox of saving, right? Uh, the the saying, the old wisdom says that hemat uh, pangkal kaya, right? Saving makes you uh, rich, but not actually, yeah, not actually. Uh, in, in in the paradox of saving, in the domestic economy, more saving means that less investment, less potential of economic growth, right? So basically, this is paradox of saving. But in the global economy, when we talk about global level, yeah, higher savings may cause to higher probability of financial crisis in other countries. So saving may create a financial crisis. This is saving glass hypothesis or excess saving hypothesis. Okay. So if you can see here from uh, basic uh, equilibrium model of an open economy, Standard Keynesian model. So you can see that in equilibrium, yeah, in equilibrium, I just uh, go directly to equation number six, yeah. In equilibrium, yeah, current account deficit x minus m, or account account balance, yeah, x minus m is equal to private saving minus investment plus taxation minus government spending. So if you want to make your current account uh, surplus happens, okay. In either way, you need to increase your saving, you need to uh, reduce your investment, or you need to increase taxes, or you need to reduce government spending. But if you reduce investment and government spending, of course, your potential of economic growth will decline as well. So uh, there is trade-off yeah, between macroeconomic stability and macroeconomic growth. If, we, if you talk about macroeconomic stability, you talk about current account. You talk about X minus M. When your current account becoming deficit, and more deficit, yeah, of course, the foreign investor will likely to, to flee. Yeah? Capital outflow will happen because of a decline in uh, uh, obvious level of foreign investors to invest in that particular country. Okay. This in terms of financial uh, macroeconomic stability. So if current account deficit happens, then macroeconomic stability also uh, oh, decreases. Okay. So, uh, but of course, if you want to make your economy grow, yeah, of course you need to uh, boost investment, right? You need to boost investment. You need to boost government spending. But actually, if you boost too much I and G, of course, you will have lower X minus M. You will have current account deficit much wider. So, so this is like a trade-off. So be careful, yeah? Which one is the objective? Whether you want to uh, strengthen economic growth or you want to maintain your macroeconomic stability. Okay. So this, this is basically uh, the story, a story about saving glut happens in the US at the time before 2008. And right now, what we are trying to explain here, whether saving glut hypothesis may also occur in the Asia Pacific. 
okay as you can see that uh, Asia Pacific right now has uh, RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, including uh, China, India, and Indonesia. Of course, America first will follow China's model uh, to increase export and then to increase uh, savings at that time. But of course, uh, if if U.S. policy is successful, if if U.S. Uh, uh america first is successful at, at the time yeah uh, during donald trump period yeah uh, that start in in several years ago so it means that uh interest rate yeah interest rate in the us will be likely to increase we likely to, to increase and we can see the the next implication of that okay let's say that if us financial crisis Oh, sorry, if you ask macroeconomic uh, policies, yeah, is uh, sound enough, is uh, uh, correct, yeah, of course, to, 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 to make it uh, more developed, of course, interest rate needs to increase. And we can see right now, if you can see from, from, from the news as well, the US is also starting to, uh, to think about uh fat rate normalization okay fat rate normalization it means that uh the us also wants to uh, increase interest rate benchmark in maybe in the uh, first quarter uh, 2022 maybe or maybe next month we don't know yet but we can see uh, the tendency of that okay and if we compare indonesia with other countries, other emerging markets, we can see that long-term interest rate per annum in Indonesia is the highest. So when there is a, a problem, yeah, when there is a problem in other developed countries or at the global level in general, basically they, they, they will likely to enter Indonesia instead of uh, going into other countries because we can see that the long-term interest in Indonesia is much higher. Okay, if yeah, we can see again uh, from the experience of of the US, okay, when a lot of foreign investment enter to Indonesia, right now we can see already the trend, yeah, the trend of increasing foreign investment in Indonesia, and also in the Near future, after COVID-19, maybe a lot of foreign investment also enter to Indonesia. That's good in terms of economic growth potential, but we need to uh, make uh, a cautious uh, or pre precaution. We need to make a precaution uh, because of what? Because uh, as the U.S. already occurred before 2008, it might happen to Indonesia if not well managed. Okay, why is that? Because when a lot of investment coming into Indonesia, of course Indonesia need to pay higher interest rate, and then it will, of course, uh, make the primary income balance Indonesia becomes more negative, and then current account uh, deficit also happens this is basically the story that that we want to uh, highlight here okay why indonesia needs to be very very cautious about about this trend because indonesia is not different too much too much with the us before 2008 as you can see here, what makes current account in Indonesia becoming deficit? It's not because of trade balance, especially for goods. Yeah, for goods. Yeah, you can see here we have surplus here. We have surplus in goods, and in services, of course, we have uh, deficit in services, but not too much. But you can see here we have primary income deficit which is the highest okay compared to other parts 
and you can also see uh, secondary payment, uh, secondary income uh, deficit, yeah, is surplus. Actually, it's not not deficit. Yeah, secondary income balance actually is not deficit. It's is in surplus at least in the end of 2020. Okay, so you can see uh, uh, this presentation. Yeah, I have also presented this one in in several. Um, seminar as well in, in LPS, Lembaga Penjamin Simpana, and also in uh, in various occasions in international conference. I also presented in in uh, the forum of policymakers. Basically, uh, they are right now aware of the situation. Although the situation is not quite uh, worrying right now, we are still in very good position. We are in, still in good condition. Our COVID-19 pandemic is, is uh, improving in terms of the case, in terms of economic recovery is, is in good condition. However, we have uh, like a risk, yeah, macroeconomic risk that is still there. And we need to be aware. We don't know yet when this risk will materialize, whether it happened uh, in the near future or, or it will happen in the next five years, we don't know. But at least what we know is that our current account deficit is mostly driven by primary income deficit and it will be exacerbated. It, it will be very risky if our capital account is also dominated by portfolio investment instead of foreign direct investment. The story is that when the US increases the interest rate, yeah, and you already heard from the news, maybe. Yeah, many foreign investors from emerging markets, including Indonesia, will go back to the US. They will withdraw their money uh, from Indonesia to the US. And then the value of US dollar will appreciate, the value of rupiah will depreciate. Yeah. And of course, you need to pay higher interest rate. You need to pay higher principal to uh, to meet uh, withdrawal by foreign investors, and you don't have enough foreign reserve. And actually, uh, because of high primary income deficit, you will have lower current account balance. Your current account will become deficit even more. When that happens, when that happens. Okay, of course, foreign investor will likely to flee more because you can see that Indonesia uh, is uh, vulnerable because current account deficit is much wider and then they will likely to go uh, from Indonesia if their investment is only short term investment so they can go easily from Indonesia. The story will be different if our capital account yeah, is dominated by foreign direct investment. That, that's why right now the government uh, promotes, yeah, promotes FDI uh, tremendously because it will strengthen the capital uh, account position of Indonesia. So when there is a normalization of interest rates, yeah, either from the US, from developed markets, Indonesia will be ready. Yeah, will be ready. And the, the risk of foreign capital reversals can be avoided because you have more foreign direct investment instead of uh, portfolio investment. So, this is the story the story about stepping glut hypothesis. Stepping glut hypothesis may occur in Indonesia from this. Uh, from this uh, figure, okay? I'm talking about may occur, but it's not necessarily will occur. So we will try to test. We will try to test whether uh, Indonesia is also uh, risky for second class 
condition if there is normalization in the US interest rate or in foreign interest rates in general. Okay, that's why in the next slide, we try to test. Yeah, we try to test whether there is a potential of saving glut problem that will lead to financial crisis, at least uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And how about Indonesia? Because Indonesia is the major destination of, of potential foreign investors, of course. And then uh, whether Indonesia is also subject to saving glut uh, risk. This is what what we are trying to do, okay? The story about saving glass, and this is basically new from the perspective of academic literature, saving glass is new, okay? So basically this is, uh, this is started from Trump's policies, yeah? Because uh, when we talk about saving glass, we talk about a uh, time frame which is quite long, and we need to, 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 to see from uh, three to five years previously what happened in the US and what will happen in the near future. That's why uh, we start from perspective of Trump policy at that time. And then of course, when right now the, 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 the policy is continued by Joe Biden and uh, US interest rate increases, there is normalization in US monetary policy. What will happen, of course, it will appreciate yeah it will appreciate uh, local currency in Asia and after that uh, if there is also a short term local interest rate decline if short term local interest rate declines and local currency appreciation of course yeah there will be lending boom okay there will be lending boom okay so if uh this, this is like two sets of the, of the of the same coin okay first we talk about uh economic recovery in the us okay if economic recovery in the us and, and, and other developed countries yeah uh, are successful enough of course they they have more money right they have more money they, they will invest they will invest to other countries right before before normalization happens, because uh, be, before normalization in monetary policy happen in the U.S. Okay, and right now, as we can see that uh, U.S. is also starting to uh, to normalize, yeah, to uh, increase again the interest rate. Before before we go in that step, yeah, we go first in the first step, yeah. When U.S. saving and other countries saving increases, yeah, and flow to emerging markets, including Indonesia, of course, there will be local appreciation, yeah, local currency appreciation, and also a decline in short-term interest rate in in Asia and also in Indonesia. That's why, if you can see, yeah, in several years uh, ago, yeah, until recently, yeah, the the policy rate, yeah. In, in, in Indonesia also is is stable low yeah not not we don't see any uh, major increases we don't see any uh, major changes uh, and we we are still maintaining low interest rate yeah in order to do what in order to boost lending of course yeah loan growth needs to increase to develop the economy okay. But that potential, yeah, that growth potential has also some cost, yeah. What is the cost? Of course, the cost will be an increase in current account deficit if investment grows faster than saving. This is basically something that we want to test. Whether there is a potential of saving blood hypothesis in the Asia Pacific region, if if Asia Pacific countries receive more financial investment from abroad, okay, and we are not talking about 
Christian channel on monetary policy. This is different story, yeah. But we are talking about macro financial economics, yeah, macro perspective. So this is the data from WDI, World Bank, and the period is actually from 2015 until 1990s uh, in terms of the, the coverage. So this is basically all data sets, of course. Uh, the, the, the data set, I guess right now is up to 2017 or 18, like, uh, the updated version, but it doesn't matter. It's just uh, we just want to to see the the pattern. Yeah, in member countries, what happened? What happened uh, in terms of the link between financial deepening and current account deficit? So we we, we want to test whether financial deepening will affect financial uh, will, will affect uh, current account uh, deficit okay if financial deepening uh, is negatively linked to current account balance yeah of course the potential of saving that hypothesis saving that problems is there yeah, there is a potential of saving that problem. So this is dependent variable, ratio of current account, the ratio of saving. Everything is uh, denominated by GDP. Uh, we have the proxy for investment is gross capital formation. Yeah, and independent variable we have a ratio of credit to GDP. So this is basically it's a simple. Uh, proxy, yeah, it's a simple proxy uh, to highlight financial deepening, yeah, because uh, Asia Pacific countries, the majority of uh, financial sectors is banking, so we, we try to focus on banking first. Of course, we can uh, ex expand, yeah, not only financial deepening in terms of banking, but also from stock market development, we can also analyze that. But for now, we just uh, want to see the the indication first whether we can indicate a potential of saving that problem in the Asia Pacific region. In terms of econometric uh, uh, exercise, we simply use fixed average expectation. It's just an exercise. Uh, it's not really uh, rigorous analysis for for publication or for academic paper, but it's, it's just only for. Uh, we see the, the the pattern. We can we can uh, know uh, at least whether we we need to be aware of or we can uh, take a breath for a while because uh, saving glass is not there yet in Asia Pacific. It's just for indication. So unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, when we see from the regression, we see the negative link, negative link between with financial deepening and current account balances. Okay. So there is a potential, there is potential of saving glut hypothesis in the Asia Pacific region. The saving glut happens because of what? Because when lending growth increases, when financial deepening increases, when credit increases, then it will boost investment. Yeah. Here we can see that investment will increase following an increase in financial deepening measure. But, yeah, but financial deepening fails to increase saving. There is no association between financial deepening and saving. That's why it uh, financial deepening will increase investment without an increase in saving. That's why current account deficit yeah happens. That's why there is a negative link between financial deepening and current account balance position. Okay, that's that's the story. Yes, there is a potential. Uh, there is potential of saving club problems in the Asia Pacific region that will 
uh, or not billion that may uh, cause financial crisis as it happens in the US before 2008. Okay. Now for Indonesia, now we can see from Indonesia. It's to basically we create a dummy variable. IDN is for Indonesia, one for Indonesia, and zero for others. Okay. For Indonesia, we can have a good news here. Higher financial deepening is actually positively linked yeah, to current account balance. So it means that there is no risk of tempering glass problem in Indonesia. So basically, you, you need to uh, uh, boost economic growth by by uh, storing uh, or by by increasing lending, yeah, it's not a problem because higher lending uh, expansion, higher financial deepening in the banking sector in Indonesia uh, does not uh, affect current account deficit. Conversely, yeah, it will strengthen current account balance or current account surplus. This is basically a good a good indication for Indonesia. However, However, okay, in terms of macroeconomic stability, in terms of macroeconomic stability, we, we have good news because higher financial deepening will increase current account surplus. But at the same time, higher financial deepening fails to increase investment potential. That's why. Financial deepening is not yet enough to boost economic growth potential because of what? Because investment potential declines. Okay, then of course for Indonesia it reiterates the debate between whether we want to focus on strengthening macroeconomic stability or strengthening economic growth potential because two of them yeah cannot be attain simultaneously we need to make a choice whether we want to focus on macroeconomic stability first or economic growth potential okay so that that story that story happens for indonesia and if you see right now so this is the policy policy implication yeah uh, before we talk about indonesia so policy implication, of course, uh, in the case of RCEP country, okay, financial integration is necessary because when you have financial integration, you create the same level of playing field for foreign investment. Maybe in the near future, interest rate is likely to converge, so that's that's uh, uh, that will make foreign investors yeah, uh, being indifferent whether to invest in Indonesia or to Philippines or to uh, Malaysia, etc. At least it will create more risk sharing. Risk sharing. So that excess saving, yeah, excess saving to one particular country can be diversified to other countries. So the, the, the narrative uh, or uh, related to uh, financial integration is still relevant for from for the Asia Pacific region. Okay, and of course for Indonesia, it needs yeah a balance, a balanced choice, of course, between strengthening economic growth or strengthening financial or macroeconomic stability that's that's very important okay because we cannot attain a both the yeah? cannot attain both and we can also see about per tantrum uh, specifically yeah specifically about indonesia if previous uh, exercise is done for a panel data for Asia Pacific countries right now 
we uh, try to uh, see the potential impact of US policy normalization yeah in the near future if US interest rate increase what happen uh, to Indonesia is there any uh, macroeconomic instability and how to prevent it okay as you can see here PI rate yeah. of course when there is an increase in the US financial rate uh, the US uh, policy rate of course PI rate needs to increase yeah of course PI needs to increase and we can see that an increase in PI rate or right now you say for the reverse rate yes yeah, just for simplification I call it PI rate actually uh, can respond after after uh, after around six months to strengthen current account balance position but from month one until month uh, five okay or around month six higher bi rate is unable is unable to increase current account balance that's why maybe maybe measures other than bi rate are also worth exploring in order to strengthen macroeconomic stability in order to maintain current account balance in good condition so deficit uh, not happen okay and interestingly the growth of bank deposit the role of funding liquidity the role of growth of deposits so you can see here when the banking system is more liquid then the current account balance is in good condition if funding liquidity increases so to make sense of this uh, the period after covid 19 around uh, one year ago yeah, from one year ago you can see that the growth of bank deposits is in the in Indonesia is actually much higher than the growth of loans. So basically, funding liquidity is, is is there. Yeah, there is no problem about liquidity risk in Indonesian banking. And as you can see as well, current account, our current account is also in good condition and in some sense, yeah, uh, surplus happen in some component. Yeah, so it's it's. Strengthening funding, strengthening funding liquidity is very important. Yeah, of course, funding liquidity. We talk about banking, we talk about banking industry, we talk about financial literacy, but it has impact on macroeconomic stability. It has impact on uh, current account position. Okay. Interestingly, as well, boosting lending expansion as this result is actually consistent this result is actually consistent with the panel data analysis that we have done previously you can see that financial depending in indonesia uh, do not cause a decline in current account balance basically current account uh, surplus happens yeah even though financial depending uh, or, or the ratio of credit to gdp increases okay and it is consistent with this time series analysis here when you talk about growth of loans actually this is ratio of current account deficit uh, sorry ratio of current account uh, to gdp so this is rca gdpx basically this is that a name of variable uh, it doesn't matter so it it shows that higher lending expansions will strengthen current account balance so i'm comfortable enough to, to say that indonesia has very good potential for for economic development for economic growth but at the same time for macroeconomic stability because of what because uh because we don't have setting blood risk in indonesia However, yeah, we, we found it initially, we found initially that credit deepening, financial deepening increases 
uh, current account uh, balances not through saving but through depressed investment. That's why it's very, very, um, very, very challenging, of course, how to create lending expansion that matters for investment and actually uh, matters for economic growth. Nah, this is basically the, the challenge for Indonesia, as you can see as well, the investment growth, in, sorry, investment lending, yeah, growth in Indonesia is actually uh, quite limited compared to consumption credit growth. That's why we need to uh, make sure it's like a research question in the near future that you want to analyze maybe. Uh, you need to really prioritize yeah, what types of credit that matters for poor financial stability and also for economic development. And here, Growth of loan here is only the aggregate number, the rough number, the the combination between between several types of loans. But we don't really see what types of loan that really matters to investment and also to uh, current account. So and, and again, maintaining non-performing loans is also important. So I'm talking when I, when I talk about macroeconomic stability, I talk about current account. Balance. This this is basically the the indicator that foreign investors see in the first place before they see the other maybe before they see all the indicators. Okay, that's why uh, instead of only relying on boosting lending expansion, okay, maintaining credit risk management is also necessary. That's why we have loan restructuring policy that happens in the post-COVID-19 period, right? You, you, you heard the news about uh, OJK policy to, to, uh, to uh, provide loan restructuring pro, uh, programs so it will uh, likely to reduce non-performing loans figures because non-performing loans uh, here empirically, we can also show that uh, higher non-performing loan can reduce current account balance. That's why maintaining non-performing loans uh, lower, yeah, it's important to increase current account balance to strengthen macroeconomic stability. Okay, that's the story. That's the story, the conclusion about Indonesia. Indonesia can boost lending uh, without worrying about the risk of saving blood because higher financial deepening, higher lending in Indonesia will strengthen current account balance in Indonesia. However, yeah, in the post-COVID-19 period, you can see here that economic growth declines and also credit growth still declines compared to uh, previous uh, yes, yeah, com compared to uh, the figures before COVID-19 crisis. There's the challenge right now, how to boost credit, how to boost productive credit or investment credit. So this is just to show you the, uh, the trend of Google Mobility Index. So basically, maybe uh, credit growth is not quite uh, improving yet because many indicators here are are still uh, lower compared to uh, the period before before uh, social distancing policy is implemented starting from March 2020. So basically, the majority of it, yeah, like uh, residential activity is still declining compared to uh, the zero line here. This is basically the baseline. Baseline is made from February 2020. All activities here is still low in in the lower uh, quadrant here, and several activities like retail and transaction, of course, is still improve, is already improving a little bit compared to the period before uh, social distancing policy before March 2020, and also parts activities also quite improving, uh, but like uh, in average, yeah, in average. In average, 
mob, uh, average mo uh, mobility still is still not yet improving compared to the period before COVID-19. That's why many demand side, yeah, demand side also matters. Demand for loans, including demand for loans, people still wait and see before they they ask for productive loans. So that's maybe that explains why credit growth is not yet improving, yeah, as expected. So in terms of non-performing loans, non-performing loans is still uh, increases, although the increase is not quite tremendously because of the restructuring policy. But you can see that the actual non-performing loan is still increasing, although loan restructuring policy is already there. So it needs to be better managed yeah, in the future. So. Uh, instead of only relying on loan restructuring process, yeah, of course, the banking industry need also to, to strengthen risk management yeah, in, in order to, to, to avoid non-performing loss from happening. Okay, I think that's all my knowledge sharing. I give it back to Adinda, please, for questions and answers. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono, for the very nice presentation. So, guys, we open up the uh, question and answer session. If you guys want to ask questions. Okay, hello, everyone. You are pleased to ask questions. Is there anything you want to ask? Or maybe if you if you have uh, idea for for research, yeah, uh, regarding macroeconomic stability, yeah, please we can also discuss as well. Mm. I know this is basically uh, it's like a new topic. I mean. Um, Saving that story. Yeah. Saving that story is, is really a new topic because uh, no one has written, uh, I mean, only on, only one paper, yeah. uh, Moral Benito 2016, to talk about financial regulation and, and also uh, saving glad. Uh, but there is no paper yet that writes about financial deepening, yeah. the role of financial deepening in affecting current account balances. Uh, and many of you uh, already know the link between financial deepening, financial development, and economic growth, right? Uh, financial deepening or financial development or credit can increase uh, economic growth from two channels. Yeah, the first one from uh, the fact that the banking industry has the capability to differentiate between consumers and potential entrepreneurs so banking industry can provide liquidity needs optimally yeah for consumers and for long-term investment and long-term investment is given higher uh, return instead of lower uh, investment or instead of lower uh, lower interest rates uh, that's why uh, people are, uh, are, are are better in, in uh, incentivize yeah to, to invest in the long-term project to boost economic growth through capital accumulation. That's, 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 that's the story. The story about capital accumulation, the story about economic growth, you all may be uh, already aware of. Uh, it's quite uh, common. But the story about financial deepening itself, uh, about macroeconomic stability, about... Um, Current account position is something new, yeah. Some something that um, not really common in the literature yet. That's why. Uh, but the essence is that uh, I I want to share about knowledge here because uh, maybe 
we are still in 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 good condition. We are, we are still uh, in terms of our credibility is very good or already, but at least you already the hidden risk. You already see the hidden risk. The hidden risk is coming from primary income deficit. Okay, and I already mentioned this to to several policymakers, to uh, government bodies. I already uh, presented this, and of course. They, they they knew it of course they knew it uh, but at least uh, uh, necessary steps maybe it's not necessary yet the the steps to 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 limit economic growth potential maybe it's not the right time yet because we don't see uh, any uh, risk that materialize soon yeah but at least in the medium run into long run if Developed countries uh, recover. Of course, they will uh, they will try to 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 uh, prioritize their countries, right? Uh, they will withdraw their investments from out from other countries. Yeah, and at that time, the risk start to manifest to materialize. Okay, I think that's that's, that's the basis. Okay. Uh, sir, we have a question yeah. from Umron Koiri. So the question is, can we as a student also participate and contribute towards the long-term growth? So that's the question. Okay. Participate uh, to boost long-term growth? Yes, of course. Uh, of course, I mean, in, in, in terms of first, yeah. You need to be able uh, to to prioritize. Yeah. Okay, let 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 me answer that question from the perspective of findings that I have before. Yeah. In order to strengthen macroeconomic stability and economic growth, you need lending, right? Before you need uh, PP, before you boost lending, you need funding liquidity. You need liquidity. So make sure that. You have uh, better financial literacy. That's the, that's the first thing. Financial literacy is very, very important. Because of what? Because this is your future skills. Future skills is not only about digital, it's not only about entrepreneurship. Everything is important. But right now, I, from, 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 from these findings that, that, that we have discussed, financial literacy is also part of financial, of part of future skills. Because of what? Because once you are able to manage your own consumption and investment profile and saving, of course, you contribute. You contribute to maintain funding liquidity. Okay, you contribute to maintain funding liquidity. You can choose between uh, consuming uh, right now, or you can choose between consuming later and and then you save first for productive purposes. Okay, that's the first thing. Financial literacy and also financial literacy also is, is, is also important. Yeah, uh, when we talk about lending, when we talk about asset side, yeah, when we talk about loan growth, you can also participate by by of course entrepreneurship is matter here. Uh, it's, it's very important here. Entrepreneurship, uh, you you can create your own business and then later on, once you have uh, good uh, financial reports, you can as loans from banking and then of course you contribute you contribute to push economic uh, growth and more importantly more importantly okay you need to be more uh, innovative uh, i know this is basically is it's easier uh, said but it's complicated to to conduct because of what because uh, in general, yeah, in general, the aggregate saving for Indonesia, yeah, saving in, in in terms of national saving, yeah, country level saving, is actually lower than other countries in Asia Pacific. Not because not because they don't have saving, but because they they have limited source of saving, yeah. Uh, what, what I mean is that, okay, when you want to increase saving, 
when you want to increase saving in general ya i'm talking about in general term ya we talk about uh, company we talk about individuals perspective we talk about country perspective when you want to increase saving national saving as we can see ya when we have higher national saving of course we have higher current account position but do not increase your saving by reducing your consumption now this is the old wisdom that okay if you want to save more yeah, you consume less this is old wisdom okay if you want to increase your saving you consume less of course your economic growth potential also declines so do not do not reduce your consumption yeah i mean in in, in terms of once again i'm talking about country level perspective i'm talking about companies and also individuals do not reduce consumption productive consumption yeah if that i mean yeah of course do not reduce consumption too much to increase your saving but seek another source of productivity a source of productive income uh, you need to be more innovative uh, you need to be more productive so or you need, you need to create more uh, business uh, development yeah so that income can increase from productivity instead of from a decline in consumption that's why the issue of productivity is also important okay maybe uh, pak dimas wants to ask mbak dida yeah mungkin pak dimas is there anything you want to answer Pak Dimas, is there anything I can help? Oke, okay, uh, sorry, ada terwayu. Uh, just set the camera on. Uh, Oke, okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, can you hear my voice, uh, Pak Wahyu? Sure, sir. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the coming of uh, Dr. Wahyu for in at our um, guest lecture series. And also, I, I would like to also thank to Pak Wahdi, who has uh, accompanied us today. Um, so Pak Wahyu, I, I just want to get your comments and maybe views about the current situation in which uh, we are in the new normal uh, after the pandemic has been uh, tremendously uh, impacting our economy. Uh, you mentioned initially about the saving glut, uh, and you mentioned about the credit uh, slowing down uh, as the impact of the uh, COVID-19 pandemics. So in my humble understanding is perhaps we have to look at the business cycles, uh, whereby the business cycle actually is going down right now and going to be maybe uh, up. Uh, going to be up upwards, uh, having uh, impacted by the COVID-19. So in my uh, humble opinion is that uh, the saving glut right now is because of the, there is no any channels uh, to which the, the fund from around the world going to be uh, used by the sectors in order to finance the economy. So in right now, the impact then, even though the, the interest rate is quite very, very low, there is no any single sectors that quite uh, eager to invest uh, in terms of the uh, money or on any other activities in the economy. So I, I, I want to get your overview, uh, Pak uh, Wahyu, is that um, in the current situation is uh, what should be actually the government policies uh, by looking at the macro potential in this perspective, because we are looking at the micro level, uh, what is the instruments of macro potentials that should be um, maybe promoted by the central bank in particular, and then also what the response, what the also the policy of the banking sectors in particular as well as the micro potential institutions in order to respond this uh, new normal. 
So we do wish that this new normal will promote the positive impact, isn't it, to the economy. Uh, so it needs perhaps the commitment from the government, either the, from the macro and micro potential perspective, so that this uh, pandemics, even though still going around, but the impact can be minimized and reduced. So perhaps that's all, Pak Wahyu, my humble, uh, I just want to get your feedbacks uh, in terms of the policy perspective, because I do know that you are quite uh, close with the uh, government and um, institutions, and also you are quite much uh, research in, that area, in, in the area of uh, banking and macro potentials and so forth. That's all, Pak Wahyu. Thank you, and sorry if I talk much too much uh, and uh, welcome back so i hope that you can be able to be our next next speaker at the other conference or events organized by our university thank you wawah you thank you pak dimas can i directly answer mbak adinda yeah, sure sorry okay. yeah. yeah so uh, it's interesting uh, views uh, pak dimas yes correct yeah there is no channel yet there is no channel yet uh, right now for Indonesia to worry about saving glass. Yes, you are correct. And exactly this is uh, the, uh, the, 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 the same views yeah, that, 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 that I also have right now. There is no channel yet about worrying uh, saving glass race for Indonesia. However, we just want to uh, highlight that there is a potential risk. Maybe it's not happening right now. It's not uh, uh, the risk of today, but maybe the risk of tomorrow. But we don't know uh, when we we need to worry uh, about about saving glass risk. That's the first uh, my first uh, take on on your first question, and very interesting. And I agree absolutely with your perspective. And also uh, about yeah, uh, there isn't. I mean, you also mentioned about the demand side. Uh, right now, the cycle is still declining, and uh, of course, uh, although we we uh, we are in the period of recovery, but we are not yet uh, uh, normal as as before. So maybe the the the, the economic actors, yeah, uh, are still waiting and seeing uh, before they ask credit. And right now. Although interest rates already declines, then uh, why credit is not uh, increasing as well? Yes, you are correct. Uh, right now we are in the period of credit crunch. Yeah, the credit crunch basically uh, uh, there are several several uh, times ago. Yeah, I, I, I also presented about the story about credit crunch. Yeah, uh, to to Bank Indonesia as well. So basically, uh, if you see uh, the lending capacity of each bank, lending capacity is actually higher. But loan growth, actual loan growth, is much lower than the lending capacity is itself. And although loan growth is increasing, and we can also see undisbursed loans also increase. Yes, you are correct. Uh, that 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 uh, although people are already granted. For credit, they actually do not uh, withdraw uh, the credit, yeah, uh, facilitated by by banks. That's why our challenge right now is not about stability. Uh, my my perspective on that, we need to be more expensive. Uh, okay, uh, expansionary, expansionary monetary policy and also expansionary fiscal policy. That's okay for now, and I agree with, 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 with that perspective because we need to focus more on developing uh, economic growth, more on economic recovery. We need to maintain low interest rate. We need to boost lending activities. We don't have to be worried about macroeconomic stability, macroeconomic instability due to saving gloves not happening yet. It's fine. Uh, I agree, and also in terms of policy in terms of macro prudential policy we already heard from uh, our use yeah the i implemented uh, uh, the ratio of um, rpm yeah 
the ratio of pembiayaan inklusif makro prudensial. So basically, uh, right now each banks. Okay, before before we go to to RPM first, you mentioned about business cycle. Right now, every people, uh, whether it is banks or, or, or company, they follow business cycle situation. Yes, correct, and that is really a drawback for banking system in general. And banking system in general is really pro cyclical. They follow business cycle. When economic growth increases, they increase lending, but economic growth declines, economic recession declines. They also reduce their lending. This is very problematic. Yeah. From three decades ago, the story about pro cyclicality of the banking behavior, it's well, it's it's, it's, it's really a problem. And and uh, and we need, of course, we need to to do more more uh, more micro uh, uh, micro perspective here yeah, from micro analysis. Uh, what kind of factors that may affect uh, procyclicality in the banking system so that we can avoid the procyclical behavior of banking? That's that's one story. And go back to your uh, to your uh, question about what kind of policies. And macro financial policies, right? RPEM is quite uh, interesting. Is is quite uh, uh, at least at least it it gives more rooms for for banks to to uh, to expand lending to UMKM, to micro and uh, small medium enterprises. Yeah, because uh, uh, the previous previous regulation. They think that minimum 20% of loans should go to uh, SMEs. Maybe it's not enough yet to um, to boost lending, yeah, in, in general. And right now, the instead of only re relying on on uh, LTV loan to value ratio, right now we have RPEM. We also have maybe uh, reserve requirement based on loan to funding ratio, QBM LFR. Uh, uh, and right now we have premium yeah, ratio intermediasi macro prudential. Uh, at least uh, these steps, yeah, these steps are already uh, proper, yeah, to to at least to enhance the supply side, the supply side of lending. Nah, this uh, bank actually can. Can uh, bank can boost lending? Right now, we can see as well that the liquidity position of banks is also very very high. So, in terms of capacity, in terms of supply of loans, there is no problem. But the problem is the demand for loans right now. Uh, and also, from from microeconomic perspective, micro uh, prudential regulation, right now. The OJK has implemented PSAK uh, 70, if I'm not mistaken. So it means that uh, the banks need to acknowledge provisions before loan losses actually occurs. So the the idea is that the bank becomes more cautious during economic booms, but at the same time, banks are not too cautious during economic recessions. So the idea is that by creating a loan loss reserve during economic booms before non-performing loans happen, actually we provide breathing room for, for banks during economic downturns. So that uh, in the expectation, of course, during the economic downturns period, uh, banks can Boost lending without worrying about the risk because they already have some buffer. They have already loan loss provisions uh, created uh, previously during economic booms. But of course, uh, the implementation of of PSAK uh, 70 as well and also uh, uh, ratio uh, pembiayaan inklusif macro prudential RPIM. Uh, actually, it's just implemented, so we need to to take uh, more time, yeah, to to analyze. So if we have a uh, longer period of observation, and then uh, we can 
try to uh, investigate whether it really works or some improvements are needed. I think that's my take on your questions, Pak Dimas. Pak uh, Mayu, if I may just a bit respond, could yeah. me, could I? Yeah, uh, I, I do agree 100% of your statement just now about the how we provide the, the, the buffer, how we provide the, the policy that can strengthen the uh, recovery process of the economy. But in my concern right now actually is uh, how actually the policymaker can maybe create a policy that can balance between the, 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 the condition whereby um, the excessive behavior face to face with the stagnant behavior. I, I mean that in the cyclists, in the, in, the, in the business cycles, we know that uh, the economy is up and down following the cycle. You mentioned about prosicality uh, just now, and we also uh, acknowledge about the um, uh, contractionary uh, policy and others. So my concern is right now actually is how, how the policy that we, we may create actually that uh, can provide the balanced policy whereby, for example, in terms of the um, interest rate, for example. So how, how much the level of interest rate that, that may uh, promote the economic growth, but in the same time, this interest rate is not uh, restrict the economy to, to, to be uh, maybe growing more and more. I mean that, what, what is the, the the, the balance uh, positions of the policy instruments so that it, it could provide the environments that not disturb the another sectors to be um, maybe uh, degrowth. I mean that they, they don't grow well. And the second one is you, you see that there is a linkage between the macro um, environments and the banking or micro environments. So I just thinking and on how to find out the optimal threshold uh, between the macro, mac macro and micro linkage so that this optimal balance can be used in order to ensure that the environment of the macro and macro here in the balance positions. Uh, I don't know whether you can 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 take my my point point. How are you? Yes. So yes. because uh, so far we also we we, we always think, uh, talking about we have to increase we have to decrease the interest rate we have to uh, increase the money supply decrease this money but but the the question remains uh, to what extent the increase or decrease of this instrument so that the environment that we are targeting actually in the balance it means that don't make a burden to the other sectors and not the burden with other sectors. So we are in the, in the, in the harmony with others. This is the thing that it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking for and I'm now uh, insert in research right now, actually. Perhaps we could uh, discuss uh, detail about this. How are you? That's all. Thank you, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pak Dimas. Uh, okay. So, it's very interesting questions and, and yes, uh, actually, uh, I'm also searching what kind of balance right now, what, what, what kind of balance uh, patterns, yeah. Uh, of course, when you talk about uh, policy, yeah. From, from LM, yeah, LM relation, LM curve, IS curve, or aggregate demand and aggregate supply in, in, in macroeconomic theory, the basic theory of macroeconomics, you can see that uh, actually, there is two, two uh, different objective, of course. Yeah, if we talk about fiscal policy, if we talk about uh, government policy, we talk about boosting economic growth, right? Through through government spending, through consumption, etc. But on the other hand, when we talk about macroeconomic policy or, or mon monetary policy, I mean, uh, we talk about stability. We talk about maintaining inflation, interest rate, and and currency uh, stability. Uh, this, this two, by nature, by nature, this, this two objective are really not uh, quite uh, uniform. I mean, that's, that's, that's why, that's why uh, 
the the literature yeah the two strengths of literature whether we want to strengthen economic growth or we want to strengthen financial stability is still uh, emerging right now so there is no really a consensus yet in the literature on how to of course yeah you are correct how to balance how to balance uh, uh, economic growth and how to balance financial stability of course when you talk okay let's maybe we, we limit into uh, the perspective of uh, macro and micro linkage i and we'll move to your second question about about uh, the mix uh, or the optimal mix yeah and we, when we when we talk about optimal mix let's say we, we we limit our discussion on financial deepening issues because we talk about uh, saving glass we talk about economic growth and we talk about financial development let's say we talk about credit uh, uh, about credit when you talk about uh, credit of course we we need to really uh break down yeah, what is the optimal level of credit to gdp or optimal level of loan growth but at the same time what types of loan that matters for both uh, economic growth and also financial stability and there is no single questions on that but it it's really uh it's really a fruitful and fascinating topics yeah to 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 investigate and and of course this is still open question is in it will be purely empirical questions that that needs to uh answer and of course once again when we talk about empirical uh, uh analysis of, of course something in the future along with the changes in 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 data and observation and also and the end in theory but interestingly if if i also may add something about uh, our macroeconomic theory right now macroeconomic theory right now is i mean uh, it's totally totally changing it's totally changing i mean uh, previously we don't think about decentralized finance right we don't think about uh, cryptocurrency and uh, we don't think about the role of innovation uh, previously, we believe that uh, financial intermediary to uh, through banking industry uh, performs better than financial authority, uh, uh, perform better than the system uh, without financial intermediary. But right now, we have the role of financial, uh, the role of direct finance, the role of cryptocurrency, the role of innovative finance, other than stock markets that actually may really uh distract yeah may really distract the 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 monetary policy theory and also macroeconomic policy theory that has not been uh, uh put yet into the uh apa namanya, the the, the theoretical perspective so more exploration is needed there is no single answer uh, there is no single questions on 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 your uh there, there is no single answers for for your questions but I believe, yes, uh, I agree too that that's, uh, that's a very important topics to investigate. And of course, uh, I'm more than happy, more than welcome if we can also collaborate yeah, to to really answer uh, this uh, this uh, topics. Yeah, I think that's all from my text, Pak Dimas, Mbak Rida. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the explanations. Mr. Dimas, do the answer answering your questions. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So I'm very satisfied with uh, Pak Mahyu. In fact, that uh, we have uh, already uh, met together actually with Pak Mahyu since uh, 2010. Uh, I think Pak Mahyu remember when we were <laughs> presenting a paper in Bank Indonesia 10 years, yes. 10 years ago. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I still save the, the photo of us, Pak Mayu, <laughs> when we did our PhD at the moment and we presented a paper at, at the Bank Indonesia. At the moment it was on the, um, I think, Bulletin of Economic Market and yes. Banking, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yes. yeah, 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 BMP. <laughs> okay, Marinda, thank you very much. Uh, I, I hand over back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Dimas. So, Mr. Imam, do we still have a time? Based on the schedule, we have to end this meeting at, at 10 past 30. I think uh, 
our we have to finish our guest lectures today. So uh, I'd like to thank you very much for Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono for the informative and interesting presentation and all of the participants for all the intentions. So finally, we would like to give the applause for the speaker, for the speakers, and for all of you. But before we end up this meeting, uh, how can we take pictures together yeah so everyone uh we invite you guys to open up your camera okay please open the cameras on Okay, I'd like to count down in three, two, one, and okay, once again, yeah. <laughs> okay, three, two, one, and okay, so thank you so much, Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono. I'd like to give this handle to Mr. Imamuddin Miliadi. Mr. Imo, I'm sorry, your voice is still okay. mute. Okay. Okay. Uh, Alhamdulillah, thank you very much, ya, yeah. Mr. Wahyu Sudarmono, and also the nice moderator, ya, yeah. uh, Sister Adinda Salsapila, and all participants, and also Mr. Wahdi Abdullah Yudi and Mr. Dimas. Okay, thank you very much yeah, about your participations and this guest lecture, and we close our meeting by pray Amdalah together. Alhamdulillah. 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 Terima kasih Pak Wahyu. Terima kasih Pak Wahyu. Terima kasih Pak Wahyu, Pak Imam, Pak Wadi. Saya selalu. Thank you, Sir. Terima kasih. 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 Ter